Our final speaker this evening uh, represents the next generation of occupational health physicians and a person that knows Dr. Harriet Hardy and that's Dr. Chris Oliver from Mass General Hospital and I'd like to ask Chris to come up and say a few words. Well, it's a pleasure for me to be here tonight to honor Dr. Hardy and I'd like to say, if you like the tape, I have here her autobiography, which I strongly recommend, called Challenging Man-Made Disease. And I'm going to read a few excerpts from this book tonight because I think these um, pieces of, of her autobiography describe the some of the qualities about her, which I most admire. And there was one quote which I believe she told me, and I cannot find Dr. Hardy who said this about you, but I think this is one of the greatest things that could be said about anybody, and that is, Dr. Hardy, Harriet, you're your own man. And I think, I think throughout her life, she in fact illustrated those qualities and was very much her own person from the time that she picked preventive medicine as a specialty when crisis-oriented health care was really what everyone was doing throughout the, the, all of the years of her life. As all of you know and has been said here today, when Dr. Hardy was working for the Division of Occupational Hygiene here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, she put beryllium disease on the map when she was investigating Salem sarcoid. Following the publication of her article about chronic beryllium disease, she said things were never dull after this. Officials of the Atomic Energy Commission, then known as the Manhattan District, came to see me when the article was published in the fall of 1946. They suggested that if I were right, they were in trouble. And of course, used to speaking the truth, I said, well, you are in trouble. <laughs> now, um, I, I have two more excerpts to read. The second has also to do with beryllium. Part of the beryllium story reflects both my quick temper and the chaos in the beryllium industry in the 1950s. Two young men from a company manufacturing explosives came to my office seeking knowledge of beryllium toxicity. They would not tell me what the beryllium was to be used for. I gave my facts and showed them chest x-rays. They seemed mildly impressed and mentioned that the president of the company that would supply the beryllium had told them that there were no cases in his plant. This president was my number one enemy just then because he had published an article in a business magazine stating that beryllium toxicity is a myth. Turning to my visitors and rapidly losing my temper, I asked if they had wives and children. Both did. I then pulled from my desk preserved samples of autopsy specimens that came from workers made ill in that plant. The young men became silent. And then finally, because many of us here do medical legal work, I do medical legal work, her thoughts and experience with regard to the area of medical legal uh, issues was of great interest to me. And um, I quote from her as follows. This work began for me in 1953 and continues in the form of writing position papers and giving advice by telephone to patients, lawyers, and doctors. One day, a sheriff came to my home while I was away to deliver a summons for me to appear as a witness at a so-called hearing before the Industrial Accident Board. My mother, living with me at the time and awed by the legal papers, took them. This was a mistake. For a fee of $2, such sheriffs are expected to give the summons only to the witness named. Without legal advice at that time, but never since, I went to the hearing as a witness. This means that I was legally bound only to read out of the record the worker was dead, specific facts such as pulse rate and laboratory findings, but I was not expected to interpret or give an opinion of work relationship, the crucial factor. Not knowing this, I answered questions put to me by the insurance company lawyer who had a medical text open on his desk and asked me to discuss cirrhosis of the liver, the worker's disease. I began, but he interrupted saying, Dr. Hardy, that is not what it says in this book. I promptly lost my temper, which had been oozing away for the last few hours. In a loud voice, I mentioned that my medical education at Cornell was far superior to his use of a sentence in a text. On and on it went until the commissioner ordered us to stop. 
In the end, my side, that of the dead man, won. I, like a winning prize fighter, went to the opposing lawyer, shook his hand, and invited him to lunch with me at the MGH to discuss the case. And I think these, um, uh, these quotes illustrate, at, at least for me, the type of person that Dr. Hardy was. In addition to admiring about her the fact that she was and continues to be her own person, as someone who takes care of patients, her dedication to the care of the individual patient, as well as her relentless pursuit of the truth, looking at groups of workers, has been very important to me in my own practice of occupational medicine. And Dr. Hardy, I just want to thank you for the model that you've given to all of us here, and to me particularly.